Around 9 of 10 o'clock at night on October 31st, 1871, sisters Mary and Emily Wilde, escorted by their uncle and guardian, Reverend Ralph Wilde, climbed the 14 steps to the front of Jarma Carner House in County Monaghan, Ireland. Candles, fires, and torches would have illuminated the exterior of the house and all of the rooms where the festivities were held. At the party, the young ladies played traditional Halloween games like Snap Apple, and they danced waltzes, polkas, and cotillions in their most fashionable gowns. Supper might have been served around midnight with refreshments like coffee, chocolate, lemonade, bouillon, wines, and strong alcoholic punches served throughout the evening. The night was loud, joyous, and filled with music and laughter. Now sometime between the hours of one and three o'clock in the morning, the attendees of the Halloween party began to make their way home. But the wild girls, however, hung back. Now to humor Miss Mary, who at 22 just simply was not quite ready to leave the evening behind, Mr. Andrew Reed, gentleman, and owner of Jarma Carner House proposed one final dance around the room. Emily watched as the unthinkable happened as her younger sister and Mr. Reed spun around the almost empty room. In just a few seconds, a part of Mary's dress got too close to a flame and soon her clothing was engulfed. Emily, desperate to help her sister, tried to assist in beating out the flames only to catch fire herself. Mr. Reed threw off his wool coat, wrapped Mary in the garment to put out the flames and he rushed outside with Emily following suit. From there, Mr. Reed either rolled Mary down the 14 stone steps into the front lawn, or Mary and her sister stumbled down the stairs together trying to roll out the flames on the lawn. Emily, terror stricken, ran screaming around the front lawn until she collapsed. Both girls died from their injuries. Mary on November 8th, and Emily a couple weeks later on November 21st. So variations of the story have been circulating for the past few years in newspaper articles, blog posts, and of course, TikToks. Medicine that's out of date. Use your private parts as piranha bait. Dumb ways to die. And all of them place blame on this horrific accident on one single thing, the crinoline. It sort of makes sense. The crinoline has been blamed for thousands of deaths during the 1800s, and this story lines up perfectly with the violent myth surrounding the crinoline. But was it actually the villain in this tragic story? <laughs> Or is this just another example of a misguided, misogyny-filled misinterpretation of female fashion history? Part one, the evidence. There are two main secondary sources that have dug into the story of the Wild Girls. The book Wildfire by Heather White, which was published in like 2002, and an article entitled The Tragic Deaths in 1871 in County Monaghan of Emily and Mary Wilde, Half-Sisters of Oscar Wilde by Theo McMahon in 2003. Or McMahon. McMahon? McMahon. McMahon. Oh, McMahon. McMahon. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Thea. I don't really know where to put the emphasis on that syllable. <laughs> you put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. I apologize. Now, Theo's article has served as the groundwork for this video, in large part because Heather's book is not in print anymore. Theo was able to reference a copy of the book for his article, and he sort of just adds to White's research with some additional primary documentation that survives around the events. Now, before Heather and Theo, the first published reference to the girls' deaths and their connection to Oscar Wilde seems to be in a biography about their father from 1942. Before that, there apparently was a mention of the incident in 1921 in a private letter between artist J.B. Yeats and his son, that after Mrs. Him had left, one of these girls had gone too close to the fire, with the result that she was instantly in flames and that both girls died. Like, that's it. This story is something that was dug up after Oscar Wilde was dead and does not actually seem to be a part of his own, like, history or lore, really, minus one one small thing, which I'll discuss later. Most of this information around the accident is a convoluted mess of oral histories, elaborations, hearsay, rumors, and just a really great example of how the game telephone can result in chaos nine times out of 10. With that being said, before we dig into more particulars around this tragedy, I do wanna let you all know that I have tried to keep everything PG because I get squidgy about stuff too. Like I try to keep it as 
friendly as possible, you know what I mean? But this is still gonna be a fairly deep look into something that might be a bit upsetting for folks and was obviously absolutely traumatizing for everyone involved in the 1870s. And as you all probably know, I am fairly open about my mental health and I'm trying very much to advocate for people to take care of their mental health. I actually quite literally had a morning session with my therapist today to help work through some really upsetting family news that my spouse and I received a few weeks ago. And all of this is why I am so pleased to say that BetterHelp is the sponsor of this week's video. BetterHelp is an online service that connects you with a licensed therapist who is trained to listen and to give you helpful, unbiased advice. Since it is an online service, you can speak to your therapist on your phone or computer, via phone call or video chat, or even just direct messaging. Whatever works best for you, because sometimes you don't need an hour long session, you just need someone that you can message who will write you back and give you the words of support that you need or just some quick advice. If you're interested in starting to work with a therapist, but the idea of trying to find one feels overwhelming, just use my link, betterhelp.com slash Abby, fill out the questionnaire, and in about 48 hours or so, BetterHelp will link you up and connect you with a licensed therapist. Plus, if you use my link or you select my name during sign up, you'll get a special discount for your first month too, which is always great. So with that in mind, thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video, and let's start digging into this mystery of the Wild Girls and Halloween 1871. As for our defendant, the crinoline, we can attribute that accusation of guilt to two different places. The first being an oral history that was documented in 1984, so you know, like well over 100 years after the event actually took place and everyone who would have been there or been alive at the time was already like super good and dead. This is the quote. The two girls attended the ball and remained there there when all of the guests had gone home. The host took one of the girls, pretty sure it's Mary, the youngest of 22, for a last dance around the floor. As they waltzed past an open fireplace, the girl's crinoline dress caught fire. As for the second quote, that comes from Heather White's book specifically. Quote, the author provides many reports on the death of ladies who had, quote, been tragic victims of that scourge of Victorian womanhood at the time, the crinoline fire. But if you know anything about dress in the late Victorian period, you'll notice a glaring error. This style of dress, which was so commonly associated with crinoline fires, wasn't worn in 1871. This style of dress was. Part two, crinoline defense. Cody's Ladies Book, August 1871. Ladies have so long been accustomed to wear crinolines that they really seem unable to throw off the fashion. And we hope it may be long before they do. For crinoline, to a moderate degree, is certainly conducive to comfort. If we ever do learn to dress without some sort of jupon, it must be by very gradual degrees. The last invention in that line is the Mr. Thompson's duplex crinoline. It is small, round, very light skirt with a steel tournure attached to the upper portion at the back. This tournure throws out the dress as required by the present mode and the lower skirt prevents that close clinging of the skirt which is so ugly and uncomfortable, especially in warm weather. I love, I love goatees. Thank you, ladies. So while yes, historically, the term crinoline was still used in the early 1870s, that does not mean that it was the same type or style of crinoline that came into fashion in the 1850s or 60s. The 1870s is what a lot of modern historians call the bustle period. Because the round hoop of the 1850s shifted into the elliptical hoop of the 1860s, and eventually that fullness just kind of became focused to the back, keeping the front of the skirts narrower and not nearly as wide. The hoop was still worn, obviously, obviously, because like they said in the magazine, it kept the feet and legs free from the skirts, allowing freedom of movement, regardless of the shape or size of the garment and air circulation. So the crinoline not only creates the fashionable skirt shape, it also serves a functional purpose of allowing the freedom of movement for the wearer. And for whatever strange reason, misogyny, men like could not at all wrap their heads around this fact. Bless their little hearts. Like the farthingales of the Elizabethan period and the panniers of the 1700s, the cage crinoline of the mid 1800s was the focus of rage and ire for men. Articles mocking the crinoline and the women who wore the fashion filled the pages of periodicals and newspapers. Crinoline made it hard for men to get around, you see, get around their own world, and that pissed them off. What a 
a mean, contemptible nation we shall be, male and female, if we cannot somehow agree to reject that edict of imperial petticoat government dictated by France, which not only disfigures the women of England, but also incommodes them, but likewise those who pay for their uncomfortable excess of apparel, men, which encumbers crowds and crushes us and pushes them off of our stools. Punch, October 1861. Oh, those poor men, the women's skirts are gonna push them off of their stools. Whatever will they do? <laughs> A popular method in trying to dissuade women from wearing a crinoline was making satirical prints around women dying from crinolines, as well as newspaper articles, which we'll get to in a minute. Images of women catching on fire, getting stuck somewhere dangerous, or being pushed into a busy road, or as one TikToker said, off a cliff. And women would fall from cliffs, fall into rivers, because the wind would blow under their dresses, under their crinolines, make them lose their balance, and fall into their... And it's this sexist rhetoric and bullying that actually gets perpetuated by the clickbait loving internet today. And so she had to be helped down the staircase like a child because she couldn't see where her feet were, which meant that it was a, a terrible tripping hazard. And while like, I'm not gonna sit here and say that there were absolutely no crinoline related deaths ever in history because weirder shit happens every day. I will say that when we read newspapers or magazine articles about these sorts of things, we really need to be discerning about it because historic newspapers are not actually that trustworthy when it comes to being reputable forms of journalism, okay? So just like today, newspapers were a mix of legitimate news stories and absolute total clickbait trash. There's a migrant crime spree killing Americans and the president's an accessory to murder. So one of my personal favorite examples of this is a story about a six-year-old girl who was struck by lightning. Lightning struck the handmade and secretly worn corset of Mary Taylor, six years old, yesterday and almost ended her life. The little girl, daughter of a farmer, wanted to wear a corset. So she gathered up some tin cans, slipped into the hayloft, and with a hatchet, hot and shaped stays. With a piece of muslin, she then made what was least an imitation of a corset. Yesterday, she crawled under the porch of the house during a storm. Lightning struck the porch and Mary's screams of pain brought her mother, who obviously was not paying attention. Dragged from under the porch and undressed, Mary's corset was then revealed. One of the stays had been melted by the lightning. The child will recover. I don't know about you, but I personally would really like to know how a six-year-old was able to take a hatchet and manipulate it so effectively to cut up tin cans into little strips of metal and then... What the hell are you talking about? So up a corset while keeping all of her fingers intact. Would love to know how that worked because I know six-year-olds, okay? I know six-year-olds. There would be no fingies left. They would just be fingiless. It, it, this crap, it's total crap, guys. Like that, that story is entirely made up, but it was originally published in Indiana and it made its way to Baltimore. It was being shared by newspapers as real news. Though anyone with a brain or who is at least met a six year old will go, there ain't no way in hell it actually happened. What the hell are you going on about? But it was news. Trending stories you need. So this is what I mean, right? Like when we come across dramatic stories, especially around women's clothing, we have to question the motivations and the quality of the reporting. We can't just take it for face value. So with that in mind, when I searched crinoline and fire in one American 19th century newspaper database, there are, there are several, but just this one. So this is, this is just a sample, okay? Got 20 hits, that's it, 12? of those hits were variations of the same story from 1858. And out of those 12 hits from 1858, nine are from the same week in March. That's just red flags everywhere, okay? We're just red flagging it, baby. 
The first article from March 20th, 1858 from the Charleston Mercury. Death in the hoop or the fatal petticoat. By a calculation made by an official hand, it appears that no less than 14 deaths since the 1st of January have arisen from burning occasioned by the wide spreading of the crinoline into the fire, drawn thither by the drought from the chimney. Wood fires which are laid low upon the hearth are the most dangerous, and the flame from them rises in an instant. We insert this as a warning to our fair country women. Interestingly, by March 23rd, we have a new story in the American press about the dangers of crinolines. How shocking. The perils of crinoline from the National Intelligencer. The frightful death in Boston on Friday night last of a young lady, the daughter of a respectable resident of Beacon Street, who was standing near the chimney piece when her undergarments suddenly took fire, was caused by crinoline the next day. We have a slight variation of the same story, but this time they actually provided names of the family and the victims. Curious. And then two days later, we have a new story circulating. At Tunbridge Wells a few days ago, a lady arrayed in crinoline had her dress ignited in passing the fire. Another lady in a similar garb who came to her assistance also caught fire. Fortunately, a gentleman without a crinoline was at hand. Okay. Thanks to his assistance, both ladies escaped with a fright and the loss of the dresses. March 25th, 1858, Charleston Mercury. So I don't know about you, but I just find it so fascinating how all of a sudden, in a matter of days, we magically have all of these stories around women catching on fire from their crinolines. Like, wow, what a coincidence. You must have rigged something. I didn't shit. I didn't rig shit. While the story from London might well be true, that doesn't mean the following reports were. It seems more likely, at least to me, that the London story caused a buzz, right? And so in order to capitalize on that popularity, newspapers started making up crap to sell copies, right? Making up shocking shit for views is n nothing new. We now return you to your regularly scheduled presidential election year programming. Foxes learn America's border crisis boiling over chaos at the border. Now, while the search did get some hits from the late 1860s and even one hit from the 1870s and one from the 1880s, the fact of the matter is, is that the style of crinoline that was worn at this height of the crinoline catching on fire craze was not the same one that would have been worn by Mary and Emily Wilde in 1871, almost 20 years later. But what the gowns did have, though, were long trains, ruffles, pleats, bows, laces, and other really frothy, frivolous, fun decorations that were really common at this point in time for women's gowns. This is fake, by the way. It's it's just a light, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Truthfully, I find this whole discourse a bit weird. Fire safety and like fire literacy was a normal part of people's lives up until very recently. Open flame was used to illuminate homes and heat homes and to cook for centuries. Children grew up around open flame and they learned how to navigate it safely. Hi, Bobby. Hey, yo. Key City? Key Sits? Since this was a very real life or death situation, fires, especially around homes, are of course dangerous today. I'm not pretending they're not, but they could be just catastrophic in the past. In October of 1871, Chicago experienced a massive fire that killed approximately 300 people and it left 100,000 people homeless and it destroyed 3.3 square miles of buildings and structures in the middle of the city. This was international news and something that even the party goers at Drama Carner House would have probably read about in the paper and they might've even been discussing it at the party. So like folks grew up learning how to prevent and deal with fires just just like we're all taught to stop, drop, and roll as children today. Advice and warnings were even written into children's literature. So not only do I find the whole ladies don't wear crinolines cause you might catch on fire thing like patronizing and degrading, but it just also doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Women of all ages would have known how to navigate their clothing around open flame. That was just a part of growing up. And it's not like big skirts were not a normal part of women's wardrobes for, I don't know, literally centuries. Now, did accidents happen? Of course, of course they did. 
Like, it, that doesn't mean that they happened due to vanity, frivolity, and women's, like, passion for fashion over personal safety. They were just accidents. Honest to God, guys, like, I was at a ball in October that had real candles out, and some lady's ostrich feather that she had in her hair, like, caught on fire because she just stood too close to a candle flame. Like, she was fine, even if her ostrich feather wasn't. But us modern people, like, we don't grow up navigating fires in the same way that our ancestors did. Honestly, as someone who grew up using a wood-burning stove to as the main source of heat in our home, I can tell when people, like, haven't actually grown up around fire. Your experience around fire and flame, it changes how you behave around it. To like carte blanche blame the crinoline for the girl's deaths while not taking into consideration all of the other factors at play, it simply just isn't fair. Whether it's intentional or not, this actually kind of frames the girls, Mary especially, as someone who was vapid and silly, which is how the crinoline fire victims were historically portrayed in period newspapers and satire as we've heard. So while the girl's clothing obviously played a part in the accident, the crinoline cannot be the single thing at fault. Now, as for the other factors at play, that's where things get interesting. Part three, making Mary and party culture. So we know based on the gravestone, coroner's report, and the death notice from the local newspaper, the Northern Standard, that the girls died in November of 1871, following a party or a ball to celebrate Halloween at Droma Carner House. Halloween in Ireland was a popular holiday that involved traditions like bonfires, fireworks, bobbing for apples, lighting extra candles and torches, melting things in fire, including lead, eating specialty foods, cakes, apples, nuts, and just frankly having a good time. Quote, Joe, age 78 at the time of this interview in 1968, he excitedly described the snap apple game in which one fastens an apple and a candle to the arms of a cross and sets them spinning. The participants then try to take a bite from the apple as it rolls past them. Joe still laughing with the memory of singed eyebrows and of the wax that got into O'Brien's mustache from the burning candle. From November Eve beliefs and customs in Irish life and literature, 1968. Okay, maybe I should just take everything I just said about fire safety back, but wearing crinolines was the dangerous pastime. Okay, can't, you can't make this shit up, guys. Another thing we need to keep in mind is that party culture in the Victorian era is something that could put most college students' nightlife to shame. <laughs> From the 1883 book, Social Etiquette of New York, we get an idea of the typical timeline for events like balls and parties. And just so we're clear, a party was smaller than a ball, but it could include dancing. It didn't have to though. Now a ball was an assembly exclusively for the purpose of dancing. And if you attended a ball, you were required to wear your most formal outfit, um, while a party seems like it could be a little less formal. Now parties started around nine or 9.30 at night, where balls could start as late as 11 p.m. Parties would conclude usually around 1 a.m. and balls could go as late as 2 or 3 in the morning. Ragers. A supper was actually served of both hot and cold dishes between 12.30 and 1 a.m. for balls and probably a little bit earlier for a party. Drinks and refreshments were supposed to always be made available from coffee, which personally I would be guzzling because this Mima goes to bed at nine o'clock at night every night, or hot chocolate, uh, bouillon for all my bone broth girlies, lemonade, wine, and punches. And if you don't know what a punch is, um, here's a recipe for you from 1873. One quart brandy, one quart of sherry wine, one pint rum, six lemons, sliced, half a pound of rock candy, two glasses of currant jelly, sugar to taste. Mix well and let it stand for a few hours. Then add six pints of water to cut that sucker down a little bit. Then add crushed ice to the bowl before serving. Y'all, that's, <laughs> that will light your butt on fire. And as someone who has fathomed the bowl, as it were, I can assure you that that punch would have knocked you on your ass. It is not your mother's Kool-Aid or Hawaiian punch. Your great great aunt Mildred's punch would make you see colors beyond what biology says is actually possible. If you're not drunk, ladies and gentlemen, uh -huh. get ready to get drunk up. Let's do it. 
Hey guys, okay, I'm jumping in here because when I was editing this video, for whatever reason, a little section of the video footage, it got corrupted and it's not like fixing itself. So I have to kind of like re-record it for you guys. Um, so I'm just gonna read off of my script here what I was trying to say when everything got messed up. So alcohol was absolutely a part of this party. That's what we really need to understand first and foremost. And actually in the 1942 biography of William Wilde, though the author gets the dates wrong, like he thinks it happened at Christmas and it was obviously Halloween when the accident happened. He does actually specifically mention the consumption of alcohol while at the party. Quote, it was a gay affair in a country mansion and it said the drink flowed freely. Part four, a fair and balanced interpretation. While blaming the crinoline seems a simple enough answer, I, I don't think that that's an accurate interpretation of the events that actually transpired that night. So here's what we do know. One, this was a ball or a party where alcohol was readily available and possibly even flowed freely this means that it is extremely likely that all attendees had at least some alcohol in their system and that no one was totally sober. This includes the girls as well as the host, Mr. Reed. Second, the festivities concluded sometime between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. per party and ball customs for the period. And we all know that nothing good ever happens between those hours in the morning. That's when regrets happen. <laughs> Third, fire and open flames are heavily associated with broad Irish Halloween celebrations. And while there are like local nuances and different celebrations within different villages and localities, the likelihood of there being more candles than normal in honor of the holiday is actually a possibility. Four, the girls, while they were illegitimate, they weren't destitute. They were obviously welcomed in society enough to attend a party thrown by someone considered a gentleman farmer. Sir Wilde was actually noted to have gone into debt to take care of his illegitimate offspring, and these girls would have been provided for. We cannot assume that they would not have attended that party in anything but dresses appropriate for their age and the year, which would have looked like this. Mary, the youngest of the girls at 22, caught on fire first while dancing around an empty room with Mr. Reed, the host of the party. I'm also unsure of his age, but I would wager it was probably somewhere between like 30 and 40 something years old. Emily, the older sister, age 24, she rushed to help Mary to help her put out the fire, but her dress also caught on fire in the attempt to help her sister. Seven. The accident began in one of the front rooms, but the girls collapsed on the ground in front of the stairs outside of the house. This means that a certain amount of time passed and there was obviously some chaos around the events since the girls were not just thrown to the floor of the house and covered in wool blankets or carpets, but just one singular man's wool evening coat. And speaking of the evening coat, while it was absolutely involved, how and to what extent Mr. Reed assisted is conflicting. In one report, quote, the host of the ball wrapped his coat around them and rolled them down the stairs in front of the house into the snow. Just a side note here, I, I don't actually know if there was snow, I don't think there was. So, because like according to a November 3rd, 1871 Belfast newspaper, which was reporting on a horse race that occurred on November 2nd, they wrote, the weather as on the previous day was all that could be desired, being fine and mild. The way I interpret that is that the weather on November 1st was apparently pretty nice for that time of year, which to me would mean no snow, you know? In another report, quote, their host took off his coat and wrapped it around his partner. So I guess Emily was SOL whom he carried outside and rolled in the snow. Again, the snow thing, I'm not 100% sure what's going on there. I think it might just be an example of hearsay. Now, while originally there was going to be an official coroner's inquest to involve witnesses and a possible jury, Sir William wrote asking to forego the inquest because, quote, in doing so, it might be a fatal consequence to the deceased sister who was dangerously ill from severe burns. So Emily, who was still alive at the time. Theo McMahon seems to find this a bit confusing and suspicious, but my interpretation of this is just that Sir Wilde was more concerned about Emily's health and trying not to stress her out with questions, visitors, physical inspections, etc., which could all have been involved in an inquest. Now with all that, here's what I think happened. After a fun night with drinks in everyone's system, Mary didn't want the night to end. And so the host, Andrew Reed, being probably a slightly tipsy, maybe drunk host who wanted to make sure everyone had a good time, offered one last dance in the empty drawing room, which was the de facto ballroom, which according to reports is actually pretty small. Servants could have already been in the process of cleaning up the mess and had removed the grate from the fireplace to work on banking the fire and putting it low for the evening. And candles could have also still been going. Mary and Andrew Drew waltz around the room, 
both at unknown levels of intoxication, though I would wager Andrew was probably more intoxicated than Mary, but you never know. And they were really getting it, okay, with that waltz, because if you've ever done a rotary waltz, you know that you shouldn't get with those things, okay? Like they are, woo! <laughs> or even a standard waltz in an into room, you would end up moving probably really quickly. So Dizzy and Tipsy, either Mr. Reed misjudged where to guide Mary since he was leading her in the dance or they together stumbled too close to the fire or a flame, which is totally feasible. And the train or some of the copious ruffles or trim on Mary's dress obviously caught on fire. They probably didn't even notice it at first until a few moments later when either Mary or Emily probably started screaming. Now, Emily, in a very brave act of trying to help her sister, would have then been beating the flames with either her bare hands, gloves, maybe a cloak if we are lucky, or maybe she used like her own skirts, which is one explanation as to how the fire jumped onto her clothing. And the other explanation is just, it was kind of chaotic and she wasn't paying attention. And during the chaos, her skirts just got too close to the fire on accident. Mr. Reed wrapped up at least one of the girls, probably Mary, based on the evidence, um, in his coat, which would have been wool, and that would have absolutely helped douse the flames, and he got her outside, which makes sense because you don't want the house to catch on fire. You know, you don't want it to spread to the building because then that's even more cat catastrophe, right? He may or may not have rolled her down the stairs, which are huge and stone, um, to help douse the fire. I, I don't know. I assume he would have kept his distance as much as possible to try and prevent this fire from spreading to him. There is no mention in any of the research that I've seen of Mr. Reed suffering any burn injuries. So it's really hard to say. Emily, she probably ran out of the house and got down the stairs on her, on her own accord. Now she might've fallen down the stairs or she ran um, and she collapsed on the lawn, possibly screaming. It could be that the shock just rendered her unconscious before she was even able to put the fire out in her own clothes. With all that being said, the Kernelin is not to blame for this tragic accident, but it's simply just a misjudgment of steps while dancing while possibly under the influence of alcohol. In addition to the burn wounds, the girls might've suffered some severe internal injuries if they had been rolled down the steps or they fell. And if the story is true about Emily screaming and collapsing from shock, she also could have very likely have suffered heart damage. Part five, conclusion. While there seems to be no evidence that Oscar had a relationship or was even aware of his half-sister's existence, he did make a mention of a woman in black who would visit his father on his deathbed in the mid-1870s. It is assumed that this is actually the same woman in black who would visit Emily and Mary's graves after their passing for about the next 20 or so years. Clearly, it was their mother in deep mourning. With that, my friends, is the story, the very, very sad story of Oscar Wilde's half-sisters. And while there is no single perpetrator, we can all agree, I think, that the crinoline would not have been the main contributing factor to this tragedy. Blaming the crinoline on this tragic story does make it more shocking and newsworthy for audience, especially modern audience, when actually logically, alcohol probably played a much more important role in this accident. But that also puts more responsibility on the host specifically the male host. And that's just not as fun of making fun of women's clothing now, is it? And so with that, my friends, I do hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. I would very much appreciate it. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do so. We talk fashion, we talk history, we talk all sorts of great, interesting things here, and I would love to have you stick around. A huge thank you to my Patreon and YouTube members for supporting my channel and supporting me. I am so grateful for you guys and uh, just, Thanks so much for being there. And with that, my friends, I'll see you all back here next time with another video, probably be about big skirts. Bye! Both the girls died. Both of the girls died. I don't know why I want to pluralize go died, but I, blah, blah. oh no, I'm doing that thing where the brain does like that thing where it, like you say a word too many times and it gets weird. Mm. Okay, okay. Oh, th thank you so much for my moochies. Yeah, I will pet you if you lay down. November 8th and Emily a couple weeks later on November 21st. Okay, so that one was more like I'm spreading the gossip. How did that sound? I liked that one. Okay, you liked that one? Yeah, okay. that was fun. Engage your little brain cell, buddy. Come on, I know you only got the one. Can you lay down? Is it working out for you? What is your deal, dude?
What is your deal? Stop your boofing. Quit boofing. I'm impressed. Oh, good. I'm impressed. Like, I'm wiping this off five seconds after you stop filming. You should just go to bed like that. Okay. <laughs> That was a small one. Perfect. No notes. <laughs> Until that's done.